So let me begin with a land acknowledgement. So we here are sitting at the archaeological research facility, which is located in Huichin, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the living and vibrant community of Ohlone people here, and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed ancestors and was complicit in attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It's therefore on us, our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance and practice in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all native and indigenous peoples with not just our words, but by our actions. So today, um, Dr. Kansa, uh, whose title is up there, um, he's going to be uh, talk about his work as the program director for Open Context, um, also a PhD in anthropology and archaeological field experience in the Near East, Egypt, Italy, and North America. His research interests explore data informatics, research data policy, ethics, and professional context of the digital humanities. He runs research and development for Open Context and manages the technical aspects of data publishing and archiving, including systems interoperability, data integration, and indexing. Thinking about all the stuff we do, all the data we produce, right? The next step is everything that you know Eric and Sarah have put together as you know kind of a roadmap for us. So this is such a critical topic. I'm really, really grateful for your being here. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Kansa. Thank you all so much. It's, I'm really grateful to be here. And um, this is like one of the first times I've actually talked uh, since the pandemic, and it's really um, just going, you know, being here is actually really special. So I really, really appreciate the chance to be able to be here with you all in person and everybody on in Zoom world. Um, hello, too. Um, uh, we've already just we've just heard a really eloquent uh, land acknowledgement. And um, I want to just highlight how it's important framing context also in the way we manage archeological information, because the same issues that um, we just raised when we uh, discussed the history of UC Berkeley, the archeology span in California and um, indigenous peoples in California and those intersections, those kinds of issues also have to inform how we um, deal with the information and communicate the information that we manage as archeologists and we manage on behalf of and in hopefully partnership with um, indigenous communities. The same sorts of issues are also going to be important when we uh, think about diaspora communities. There's a lot of uh, peoples in the Bay Area who are uh, essentially uh, descendants or are refugees themselves from places around the world where archeologists also work and their own interests and their heritage is also something that we also have to acknowledge and support. So um, these kinds of framing issues, we're gonna um, not just sort of mention it at the beginning of the talk, but hopefully we're gonna be able to touch on this over and over again repeatedly in different contexts when we talk about some of the information concerns that we'll be exploring today. So um, some of the things that we uh, wanna talk about just to, at, at a very high level, um, information, contextual integrity of information is something that um, we have a lot of concern with. Uh, our name is Open Context, and so context is something that we seem to care about for Open Context. But context is also something that archaeologists really, um, you, you know, really routinely discuss. It's something that is actually one of the uh, cores of our discipline, and how we try to understand the past is through our understanding of context. And the, one of the really interesting questions that um, I wanna raise and explore today is how do we represent context in archeological data, in archeological information? And how, and do we do a good job at uh, representing context, making context um, uh, actionable so that it can inform our interpretations? And that's something that um, we'll explore. I'm also going to talk about um, some of the specific approaches that we have uh, with our specific platform service, uh, Open Context, and how we manage information. And um, today, we'll just close out with a few 
notions of some um, just general good practices that is uh, something that we could all apply whether or not you're using like online data or offline data or just managing your own projects, uh, some just practical good tips. So those are the three main things I hope to get through today. Um, just a real brief background and introduction about um, Open Context. We're a data publishing service. We're an open access data publishing service. Um, and we publish open data that's openly licensed. Now, because we focus on open data does not mean that um, we think that all data should be open. That's not the case. There's a lot of sensitive information that uh, we encounter as archaeologists that should not be on the public web. And um, that those uh, sensitive kinds of data need to be curated properly, but it's beyond the capability of a small um, four-person organization like ours to be able to do that adequately. We're focused on that subset of archaeological information that can and should be open. And that's the services that we try to provide. Again, it's not the that it's not the sort of universal things that we can provide services for, but we try to focus on uh, what we could um, uh, offer services with um, uh, in, in, in ways that are appropriate. Um, and hopefully, we'll, as we talk today, we can talk about what is how do we figure out what is appropriate for open access, open data dissemination, and what kinds of processes and governance needs to be in place for thinking about more sensitive kinds of information. Uh, we work in collaboration with lots of other information systems out there too. So um, the, uh, one of the critical services that we use is from the University of California, the California Digital Library. They provide archiving and preservation services for the data that we publish. And they also provide persistent identifier services. And those identifiers I'll be talking about a lot um, that allow the information that we publish to be citable and linkable with uh, other information sources that are out there. Another thing is that um, we really rely on the work of other information systems that are curated by other organizations, other professional communities, where they're um, putting a lot of thought and effort into providing information that helps add a lot of context to the data that we publish. And we cross-reference and link to that information because that helps uh, provide a lot more meaning. And for a lot of this, uh, and for our general approach, um, we work, have worked and continue to work closely with the digital library community. And we've gotten recognition from that community for uh, working on uh, data curation kinds of issues. Professional societies, the American, um, the Archaeological Institute of America, the AAA, uh, awarded us, uh, uh, gave us an award in 2016. And we also uh, received recognition from the Obama administration, from the White House in 2013, for promoting uh, data sharing and openness in the sciences. Uh, really briefly, this is our team. Um, and um, I, you know, everybody here on this team are very dedicated scholars doing an incredible amount of work. And I can't summarize everything. Um, this is taking multiple talks, uh, but we do have um, people that specialize in different aspects of this overall landscape. So um, Megan and Paulina are focusing most of their work on public education and instructional programs uh, using uh, data, archeological data. Uh, Lee Lieberman has been working on uh, professional development kinds of programs so that archeologists can engage with uh, in good data practices. And she's been working closely with a lot of professional societies to develop programs in this area. And uh, Sarah is also our executive director. So, and um, as we were, in, uh, as in the introduction, I'm primarily focused on some of the technological sides of things. Um, just a few questions uh, while we get going here. Um, how many people in this room have ever shared data in any form? Like if you ever published anything? Right. <laughs> awesome. Yay. Um, and then how? how? How have you shared data? Have you, has anybody shared data in, uh, say, a table and a paper? Right. Okay. Um, anybody share data in a repository like TDAR? ADS, open context, anything like that. Okay, <laughs> yes, <laughs> awesome. Okay, so why not? I mean, there's a so smaller numbers of people who put data into a repository than into a paper. So why is that? So we have these services, TDAR has been around some, for a very long time now, so it's more than 10 years, open context since 2006. 
So why is it that there's, there are a few people who are putting digital data sets in a repository versus in a paper? It's an interesting question, right? So, um, all right, let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, how many of you have ever reused any data that anybody else has provided? So you do your own work and you want to compare it with somebody else. How many of you have ever looked at anybody else's data? Okay. Anything useful in anybody else's data? <laughs> How, how hard was it to use? Was it hard, easy? Hard, hard, hard. yeah, it, it is hard. Okay, uh, what was that source of the information? Anybody use data from a repository someplace online? No, one, two, right? Okay, so that's that's somebody, that's, that's something. And um, so do you feel like when you're looking at somebody's publications or data, um, do you feel like you have an adequate understanding of context? Okay, hardly ever, right? Yeah, so yeah, so context is one of these really hard things. And we seem to do a bad job in our discipline um, communicating context in any sort of publishing venue that we have, whether it's digital data or conventional publishing. Oops, okay, good. Um, so um, that sort of informs some of the challenges that we face. So in dealing with information in archeology, span especially digital data, here are some like the big core challenges in some way. So uh, ethical, right? So we do not want to re, uh, reinforce or recapitulate or rebuild colonialism online. Um, that would be bad. And uh, at the same time, we wanted to actually try to use the uh, affordances, the opportunities that we have uh, with digital information to try to maybe do things better, engage more, um, be more collaborative. Um, and bringing in people to shape our agendas in ways that are, um, you know, better aligned to our ethical priorities. So these are some opportunities too. It's not just dangers in digital spaces, but there are also important opportunities. Um, one of the big challenges in our information too are just semantics. Everybody describes things in very different ways. Archaeology itself is a very inherently multidisciplinary kind of endeavor. So we have inputs from all sorts of different fields, right? We have zoology, we have botany, we have soil science and geology, geomorphology, we have art history, we have anthropology. We have all sorts of things that are feeding into us that make um, uh, uh, juggling the information kind of hard. And we also have, you know, regional specializations, different kinds of traditions and describing chronology and describing typology, all sorts of things. It makes uh, the semantics, the meaning of the information that we have really hard to juggle. And we have to do all of this with like no budget and very little technical support, right? So that's the other really hard thing. So just the technology of dealing with all of that diversity and all that complexity uh, is a really big challenge because we don't have a lot of resources to draw upon and be able to um, engage with all of that. So the capacity is a big deal. And of course, we have to do it all, right? So you have to sort of like divide your attention amongst all of these different kinds of things and our time and attention and our money is scarce. So, um, you know, it's great to promote data professionalism and reproducible research, but you have 80 other priorities you have to deal with, like emails from the Dean or whatever, you know? So there's a lot of work to do and limited time and limited capacity. So, Two big framing things like data, um, and um, these are the sort of guiding principles that are being promoted right now about how, how to deal with data and how to deal with it, um, this sort of information uh, appropriately. There's the FAIR principles, um, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and the CARE principles. Um, the CARE principles are collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. FAIR is sort of about trying to make data free flow and fungible and reusable so that it could be compared and aggregated um, actually at really big scales. The care principles are really more concerned about uh, the social and cultural embeddedness of information. So that's sort of um, the community associations with it. Contextual uh, richness is something that is really important with the care principles. And you think that there's sort of a, there's some tension there and there are real tensions between those two main principles. But, and those are things that we have to navigate. And this is what makes information in archaeology so really awesome to deal with. Because it's like, if you want some really hard problems, this is a great place to play. 
really, and not just playing, but you, you know, you really, we really need people to engage with these topics. It's, 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 it's really core. So we have to, these are the um, things that we have to uh, consider. And uh, we'll be talking about pair and fair types of things um, as we continue on here. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, we have tried to grapple with this stuff, these sort of two things, care or fair kinds of concerns. Uh, care didn't really come out, I don't think formally until like 2018 or something like that. But um, before we even put anything online, we started, we, we wrote and put a lot of thought into intellectual property, traditional knowledge, indigenous um, uh, sovereignty, issues in, uh, in, in the sort of management of information, cultural heritage information. So this uh, journal article from 2005 that I did with um, two colleagues, uh, Jason Schultz is actually an intellectual property attorney, Arsh Bissell, um, ecologist. And um, uh, this is something that uh, really uh, touched a, um, a lot of follow-up stuff with um, uh, including work with a really interesting and important project called IPINCH, the Intellectual Property Issues and Cultural Heritage. It was uh, headed by George Nicholas, Simon Fraser University, and uh, Joe Halliwell. And um, those, that issue, uh, that IPINCH um, gave us a lot of really good guidance that we um, made into, uh, we tried to put into practice um, with our own policy. So our terms of service, terms and conditions of service for open context, and our intellectual property uh, policies really uh, derive from a lot of the insights gained from the IPINCH project. And we're really grateful to, uh, for that work and um, for our participation with them. And this is all continuing too. So uh, we're continuing to develop um, new projects, um, lots of grants being written, um, that type of thing and collaborations um, also with other repositories, digital libraries, um, uh, uh, organizations that uh, represent various uh, indigenous cultural heritage interests too. Um, and late, stay tuned, we'll, some of those will actually connect with some funder and we can um, uh, talk more about that later. So um, now those are some of the sort of background issues about why this is interesting, it's hard and um, this, it's an ongoing area where good practices are evolving. Um, the way that we consider this for our own approach is that um, we're a publisher of data. And the idea that we have is that um, archiving, just preservation of information is really necessary, but it's not necessarily sufficient. Um, we also need the intellectual investment in um, making that data better and making that data more useful. Uh, trying to align it with research and ethical priorities and community needs, thinking about interoperability. How is this information going to be reused? How do, and how do we uh, try to communicate meaning and um, that, that can be understood by wider communities uh, currently and into the future? So basically it's the same thing as like, uh, as publishers, uh, we work with data authors, data contributors and trying to uh, edit, review, promote quality in order to make the communication more effective. So uh, very few people write a paper and then just post it online. Uh, typically it goes through a peer review process, it goes through editing and you get comments, you try to make improvements, there are copy edits, all of that work goes together as a sort of co-production of uh, scholarship, right? You plus the reviewers, plus the editors, plus the copy editors, that is a collaborative effort. Uh, when you publish uh, a, a manuscript, like an article or a book. Similarly, those kinds of services and collaboration we think are important with data. So that's why we call ourselves a publisher of data, and we, because we provide those services. And the services, we uh, two big areas of focus are on uh, contextual integrity and data quality, and um, also trying to deal with issues of complexity. So data quality is hard to define. Um, and um, so a lot of the definitions sort of focus on what's the sort of suitability of uh, reuse? How, how, how can you feel like you can reuse a data set with some confidence? Um, and uh, does it sort, uh, support your analytic goals? That's the sort of one of the definitions of quality. And so it you know, really depends on what you're trying to do with the data set, if a data set is gonna be of sufficient quality to support that agenda. 
Um, and what's interesting when you think about long-term reuse and you want to preserve information, say, for future generations, reuses may evolve over time and new applications are going to come up and uh, the data might be understood in uh, context of other data sets that are um, yet to be uh, available. So um, this is a moving target. And um, so one of the things that we try to do is to try to uh, think about quality as something that um, also unfolds over time and can improve over time as additional information, additional context can be made available to enhance the power of a, a given data set. So a data set in isolation might not be all that interesting, but if that data set is part of a larger whole, then it becomes something that may be more interesting over time. So a um, few dimensions of quality to think about documentation. So, you know, can you understand it? Is there enough background information to provide you a sense about how it's collected, the methods, um, or what sorts of problems and uh, what's missing, the gaps, that type of thing? Specificity is also important because the more specific the information is, the more likely you are to be able to uh, manipulate it in different kinds of ways. If it's very general and very aggregate, you can't sort of you know, something that's been lumped together, you can't necessarily split all that easily afterwards. So that's why specificity is an important element of data quality. We try to publish very specific results with open context. So, um, you know, when somebody wants to hand us like a summary data table that, you know, at this site, we have 10% sheep and 20% goats, I and mean, that's great. But it would be really nice to have the specific bone elements because then somebody might, can say what the measurements are, the goats and the sheep and the, um, compare it with, uh, you know, taphonomy or whatever. There's a lot of more sort of, um, of opportunities for interpretation and analysis if you have much, much more specific information. And then completeness. I and mean, then completeness is something I want to talk about because that touches on with context. So um, one Lots of people here probably have worked on collaborative projects, right? How many people work on collaborative projects? Okay. Who here considers themselves like a specialist? Okay. Like, and do you ever get sufficient information from the rest of the team sometimes? <laughs> okay, good. Yay, good for you. But sometimes you're working on different timelines, right? So you might be looking at a collection years after it's been excavated. And then you have to rely on documentation that has been collected by other people. And um, sometimes you're um, going to be, uh, you know, that documentation is all that you have left. It might be incomplete. And so there's some issues associated with that. And so the different timelines of different kinds of people working on an archaeological project, that uh, creates some frictions that um, we want to talk about. And um, people might have different uh, timelines also in their publication and dissemination. So like you might want to really, really, really get out your seed or your bone report really fast because you've got some sort of deadline, like, you know, tenure or whatever. And the excavation director is just dragging their feet because they really can't figure out if this locus is stratum A or stratum B or whatever. So they can't want to, they don't want to commit. So these different kinds of timelines also <laughs> impact um, the context that we have available because you might have an incomplete context. You might have incomplete context information because the, the timeline of dissemination for one aspect of the project is lagging compared to another aspect of the project. And so that's, that's really uh, difficult. And I'll talk about identifiers. So how many of you have ever encountered tabs like this? Okay. <laughs> So this is actually kind of, kind of common. So like if you're a specialist, you're looking at bags and bags of stuff or trays or whatever, and it's got all sorts of identifiers on them, meaning the names of say, archaeological contexts or like a, a small fine number or something like that. And you're trying to record all of that. And um, sometimes that might be written with like a Roman numeral and sometimes an Arabic number. Sometimes the dates are gonna be uh, Euro style. Sometimes they're gonna be American style. All of these variations um, really start muddling stuff when you're trying to record all this. So you might be building your own spreadsheet and you're recording all of this information. And somebody else might be doing the same for like you're doing seeds, somebody else does the bones, somebody else does lithics. And you record it all, and hey, nothing actually fits together because the Roman numeral, somebody wrote Roman numerals on one thing, and somebody wrote Arabic numbers on another. 
So that's, so these kinds of practices where you're working in, in isolation and without having a lot of coordination with the rest of the people that are looking at other aspects of the material, that creates a lot of problems when you start trying to bring together context. So this is just a little illustration of that. Um, the, you know, pr a pretend Roman site. Um, here's context information, locus. Here's uh, the bone person recording things with Roman numbers sometimes, and then um, the, the, the coins person recording it with other ways. None of these different tables here would actually join together, right? You'd have to sort of, you can sort of do, do it by hands, so you can intuit how they might relate, but for a computer, these things are all really different. They're not going to relate together. So you can't bring that information together. And this is actually, we're breaking context, right? So the contextual understanding of the coins is you can't associate it with the, uh, the stratigraphic unit information or the bone information. And so this is a common kind of problem that we encounter when we deal with archaeological data sets. And so it makes um, each one of these things is an isolation. Being isolated, it's less complete. You can't really see how it relates to the bigger picture. So with open context, we spend a lot of our time going through identifiers and trying to make those things, make the corrections, try to work with data authors to try to uh, identify where there might be problems and how to fix them and that kind of thing, because then we can start bringing together that information. All right, so uh, the other aspect that we try to deal with is complexity. Um, sorry to inflict this on you. This is an entity relation diagram, which is database speak for the sort of organization layout of a relational database in this case. And this happens to be for one cemetery, Anglo-Saxon cemetery, and the data set is archived in the archaeology data service, and there's a DOI to it, which means you can download it, and they provided this really awesome, great documentation. And that's great. It's documented. You can figure it out. Um, but the problem is you have to do this over and over again. You have to figure it out. You have to look at these kinds of relationships and scratch your head trying to figure out what the relationships are um, over and over again. So if you want to do some sort of synthetic study that aggregates information from multiple of these projects, you're in for a giant headache because every project might organize their data very differently with a similar level of complexity. And that and taming that complexity is something that is a big priority in managing archaeological information. So um, really quickly about our approach. Um, I won't get into too many of the technical details, but imagine lots of those sorts of entity relation diagrams, very complicated. Um, every project has its own way of organizing things. We have something called an extract transform load. Which, um, uh, process ETL, um, which is basically to uh, take that project specific way of organizing it and map it and relate it to our general way of um, organizing information that we have and uh, with open context. Uh, internally in open context, we have a graph data store, which is, allows us to represent that variety of ways of organizing information. And, um, but Instead of having a million different relational databases, we have one database that we can have common querying and interface services that allow this kind of information to exist in open context and the project information is there described as it's originally described using vocabularies and attributes that it, as it's originally just documented in its original data sets. It's just that it's represented in a big graph database structure, which allows us to be able to provide a user interface around it and querying interfaces around it, whereas we couldn't do that if we had to do that with every random relational database that we got. Um, now, that's only one step. The other step is we try to uh, uh, annotate, add additional information to say that um, there are uh, common metadata, um, common ways of describing things, because you know, even if we relate, uh, keep a bunch of randomly described things into, in one place, it's still hard to use. Having additional ways, cues about clues about meaning that are common to multiple data sets, that helps usability. So these are the two ways that we try to help manage the complexity by um, modeling things uh, in a common graph database and then adding those annotations that allow things to be cross searchable. So uh, what does that look like? Um, here, 
this example on the on the left is uh, cattle. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting really big on the screen there. Sorry, Zoom people. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that's cattle metapodials um, from about 30 different projects in uh, Southwest Asia and in Europe. And those can be comparable. Um, they have, they might have common measurements. They have, they're described according to a common biological taxonomic schema called GBIF, uh, Global Bioinformation, uh, Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And uh, something called Uberon, which is there for describing it. Uh, anatomy. Those common uh, ways of describing things and common measurements allow this data set to be explored as a whole. And we also provide chronological information, geospatial information and common standards that allows one to do maps and things like that. And then you can start things, start exploring questions about like size changes, uh, maybe associated with domestication or if like Roman cattle husbandry because maybe they're fathering animals differently from than uh, Iron Age and um, medieval kinds of periods. So these are really interesting kinds of things that one can explore um, by relating a bunch of diverse information to uh, a common set of uh, attributes. And we're increasingly doing that also with the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus for Material Culture. It's easier to do with Zoar because more of a tradition of reuse and regional kinds of comparison than Zoar archaeology. Material culture is harder, but we're starting to do more of that with the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus and a few other standards that people publish. And we formally use the British Museum Thesaurus, and I'll get back to that in a minute. So there's some of those annotations. Um, are for interoperability to be able to aggregate data in interesting ways. And then some of those annotations that we provide, the linkages that we provide, are also for providing additional uh, context. In this case, context with literature. So uh, we have a project called uh, the Digital Index of North American Archaeology, which is a big gazetteer essentially of uh, sites that are uh, drawn from public records, so mainly from state shippos. And um, we've uh, looked at the sites, uh, the identifiers for those sites, and we've related them to uh, publications in JSTOR and also the Federal Register. The Federal Register has regulatory determinations, US government regulatory determinations about um, uh, decisions that are made about that impact different archaeological sites. And you can actually make a map then of the, that literature and the coverage of that literature uh, by uh, seeing uh, the site information in um, identifying it in the in the literature, and then we know where the sites are because of uh, what because the shippers have given us that information, and we know where the sites are to a low degree of spatial precision. So we're not making a map for years. So that's the other thing. <laughs> so this this information is allocated binned at a, about a twenty uh, by twenty kilometer grid. So uh, that's not a threat to uh, site integrity. Um, another key aspect of that, that linking aspect, and this gets back to the uh, framing point where we talked about colonialism. Um, it's not just about interoperability. Context is something that um, we can and should treat more formally with archeological information and also descending communities. And, um, one of the projects we published um, uh, has to deal with uh, a, a site um, that uh, is was excavated uh, through a collaborative excavation with the Lower, uh, lower Elwa Klallam tribe. Um, it's uh, the Olympic Peninsula, uh, Washington State. And um, the recognition of that sovereign nation's interest in this data set needs to be expressed in ways that can be widely understood. So one can just write it down, and we have written it down here um, as a sort of a text note. But just as a text note, that doesn't necessarily make it interoperable. If, it if this information flows into another repository, another digital library, if it gets indexed by something, it's not necessarily going to be understood in that way. And so one of the really critical things that we need is an infrastructure, additional infrastructure to express those associations, those interests between a descendant community and some information in a way that is going to be widely understood across multiple platforms and systems. 
And so there's a really interesting project called Local Context, which is trying to provide that kind of framework, that kind of metadata framework, so that information can be understood and understood in ways that can be recognized by different library systems, different publishing systems. So the same way that you're sort of, you know, if you're um, a, a researcher, you might have an identifier like uh, an ORCID that says that you are the author of an article. Well, that kind of information is based on a set of standards and it's understood by libraries and search engines and whatnot. This kind of information that shows the contextual associations, the social need to connect living people with, it, with information documented with their ancestors, that information can also be expressed with similar kinds of standards. So this is an interesting example where those care and fair principles kind of complement one, one another about the sort of issues of interoperability also can be used to serve the agenda of um, meeting the needs of context, the social con context of information. All right, um, this is just a, a few examples of reuse. Like all of that information that I'm doing, uh, that, that I showed you um, gets uh, reused in, in interesting ways. Um, people have done augmented reality, people have done um, uh, uh, work on data visualization. And there's also, um, I think uh, depending on how you count it, something like between 60 and 100 different publications in the past year and a half or so have cited open context, uh, according to Google Scholar. And I'm gonna skip uh, ahead to just get to some things that I wanna talk on and then talk about and then close because we're get, getting on time now. Um, uh, this is, um, Open Context has been around since 2006. So this is, these are some screenshots of um, the latest iteration of um, our project. And um, to highlight why this matters and why this matters for interpretation and for teaching and things like that, this is, uh, these are spatial distributions of textile implements at a, an Etruscan site in um, Giuseppe Siena in Italy. It's where we hang out every summer, it's nice. And um, this is, represents something like 54 years of excavation at the site. And um, what's cool about this is that these are racchetti, which are spools. And um, over here on the, uh, on the right there, you see spindle whorls, two different uh, textile implements, and they're very different spatial organization on this site. And that, you know, suggesting different kinds of spatial patterning and different activities related to textile patterns. And that is something that just sort of comes out new. It's a new thing because we mobilize the data. And, and uh, as we work on this and we provide new user interfaces on this, these patterns can start uh, emerging. And um, this is actually used a lot now in teaching. And, you can, and people are writing papers about that kind of thing. So mobilizing the data, making it dynamically accessible like this um, in a common interface really has a value because it allows this information to actually um, be used in conversations, right? And that's, that's great. Problem is it's expensive to build and hard to maintain. So um, again, uh, <laughs> this is how it feels like to be a technical director of open context. You're pushing the boulder uphill all the time. And uh, we've rebuilt this about five times. Um, what's interesting is that the kinds of things that we do with visualization and search interfaces and querying and all that, other people do too, right? In archeology, span outside of archeology, span and really ideally, um, we don't want to reinvent any of those wheels. It's really a lot better to try to reuse the work that other people have done and have contributed in an open source way. And that because it's open source, then we can, that we can redo it. So as far as sustainability is concerned, a lot of our own sustainability is easier to accomplish because other people are actually engaged in this field and making important contributions. And then we can um, leverage those uh, contributions for our own work. One hard thing about this is that, um, and this goes into the future, and I think I'll um, probably close here just because of the time when we have some questions. Uh, uh, governance and sustainability is not guaranteed. So uh, one important case study is actually the British Museum. And they published a really important thesaurus uh, back in 2011 or so. And um, lots of people used it. And that thesaurus, remember, like linking together like all those animal bones, those kinds of 
um, uh, common frameworks for organizing this kind of information, they published that, other projects started using it, and then the British Museum just dropped it without telling anybody. <laughs> and we, a lot of us were left with broken links. And that's a bad thing because it just broke all of the sort of contextual associations, right? Because those links bring those contexts together. So it's really important to be able to do that, um, to, to have that context, but if somebody has to actually maintain that. And the British Museum decided that they didn't want to do that anymore. Um, they wanted to play with Google and Samsung and very clammy projects. So that was a, so that, that's a big problem. And um, this is an interesting kind of a thing when thinking about prioritizing this, like, um, you know, the British Museum directors, they didn't make a priority of this. Our community needs to make these kinds of issues and sustainability and sustainable engagement in these kinds of issues much more of a priority. Otherwise, key contributions like this that actually make a big difference make a, uh, for organizing information, making it much more useful, those things can be dropped very quickly and everything falls to pieces again. And that is something that I um, could probably close with because we're at time. <laughs> so. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so you, I would love the fact that you got into this right away, which is the difference. And I think the care and fair thing is a really good way of talking about it. Um, thinking about when uh, context is appropriate. You know, and you said you want to create looter maps and things like that, right? Right. So, so for example, I was just, just working through this this week with a community partner where they're looking for land repatriation from a landowner whose family's investment in that is like, where exactly are they? You say there's people in the ground here? Yeah. And so the 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 tribal the tribal um, leadership offered data sets that included like ground penetrating radar maps you know um mm -hmm. but d left off all the actual spatial coordinates as to where people's mm -hmm. final resting place were mm -hmm. but as a way of showing like hey we got the uc berkeley people to do the, the radar work mm -hmm. and you can see that they found quite a few of our ancestors on the property that it would be meaningful for us to be able to care for them properly and right repatriate the land right so Obviously, this is kind of like what you're, you're talking about the literature. Right? You don't, you don't want to tell people where people are. You don't want to tell the broader world, rather, mm -hmm. where people are. But you want to be able to share the data enough that the owners of the land are motivated to repatriate, it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, how you know when you when you when you were if you're being asked to and you maybe who knows <laughs> if you get asked to, to to help create this as a a replicable research project. So let's say. Um, the tribal leadership decides to pull away from the project and they want to work with a different, you know, partner right. on, on doing the work, right? Um, they want to own the data, yeah. right, that we produce. Yeah. Um, but, but they also need to be able to share it in ways that sometimes protect the actual geospatial information. Right. So, like, those kinds of things. Um, how, would, how would you recommend, just in that kind of case study, how those types of, of pieces of a project be laid out? Because yeah. I think stripping context is important. Yeah, yeah. I it's um, dealing with sensitive data is hard and expensive. Mm -hmm. It just is, mm -hmm. and um, and then the people that are best equipped to understand who should have access and who shouldn't are the people that have the local contextual knowledge. Right? They know the actors and the players, and they have their own interests at heart. So really, the best kind of solution is um, like if this nation has its own digital infrastructure that it manages like controls. Mm -hmm. The problem is capacity, right? Mm -hmm. It's costly. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, so uh, the, the best thing that to do would be, you know, I mean, there's ways to reduce the cost, open source. There are good open source solutions for various kinds of information. So um, one thing I didn't get into is, um, there's a there's a system that's uh, open source uh, that's been financed by the Getty Conservation Institute called Arches, which is a really powerful geospatial database tool and it have total control over managing access and permissions issues. And if they can run that, that would be uh, really useful. But running that itself requires some expertise and money and server and all that kind of thing that not everybody has. Right. 
Right. And so, um, you know, advocacy is, you know, really the, the main kind of tool that we can have. It's just like, you know, if, um, if, 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 if a sovereign tribal nation in the U.S. has the resources to be able to do that, then, you know, they can manage their heritage in a way that really suits their interests. And that would be the ideal solution. Mm -hmm. But that requires access to that, those, that money and the resources. And it's money and also technical expertise. There are some nations that really have that. So yeah. I think that uh, like the Seminole Nation in Florida has, uh, it's got like exemplary kinds of systems and processes and people in place. They're doing a great job with that. But again, that's a, that they, they have a capacity that is not, um, you know, necessarily the same that um, another group would have. Like a non federally recognized community partner. Right? Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's a, you know, um, this is where, you know, I, I, it's like anything in the space, right? Um, you, it's really hard to do good work without the financing. I mean, you know, things like even open access, right? Like, that's great. Make a, uh, Open access is great. And then, you know, some open access measure might come out that requires really expensive APCs and that cuts out like junior scholars and unaffiliated researchers because they don't have anybody to pay for that. And then that's a, that's a bad thing in, in that way. But so, you know, that having the resources available to do the good work is what's really important. I think we need the advocacy there because um, it's not just going to be a technical solution, but you really need to have the um, organizations have the resources to be able to manage this in the way that they see that. Yeah. yeah. Did you see Nico's question? Oh, no. He says, can you tell us more about the changes in the new version of Open Context being rolled out? Yeah. Um, you might have to repeat the question. Yeah. yeah. Right. Are they digital uh, online uh, audience? Yes. So uh, what are the new what are the new changes? Um, a lot. Um, a lot of it is going so, so some of it's just better user interface stuff. So this is the this is the uh Kedi, the spools. Um, and you know, changing the colors, being able to um, zoom in on things in more interesting ways, uh be able to uh, one thing would be like if I just click on an object here, that's that's a spool. Um, like a little banner image that shows a sort of visual context of where, where this record comes in with the rest of the project. Um, there are improvements in speed and stability and scaling and um, the uh, so, which are all important and also things like standards alignment. Um, the, the, there are are um here's uh, another example this is uh this is uh, let me sh back to this this is a survey data set we're all the way now i'm jumping into the peloponnese in greece okay this is a survey data set um uh created by uh david Pettigrew and colleagues and um this is one of the things we've been building is a lot more visualization to be able to sort of explore a data set and understand what's in it um, and in a sort of a more formed manner. And so this represents uh, a sort of a quantitative view of the uh, time periods associated with the different objects that were collected in the survey. So some objects are very, have a lot of uh, kind of uncertainty in what they date to, some are much more specific. And so the, the wide bumps are very uncertain kinds of objects, but the, the, the narrower ones are more, um, chronologically sensitive kinds of material culture uh, that have narrow time frames associated with it. And then you can pile them on top of each other and color code them based on quantity and, and the height of the lump is based on quantity. And that gives you sort of a visual impression of time in an interesting way. So these are, these are some enhancements that we're doing. We're basically, a lot of the enhancements are really for usability, uh, user experience. Um, most of the sort of standards in terms of interoperability have been put in place for a while now, but a lot of what we're trying to do is just to make this more um, usable, and so you don't have to be a completely maladjusted nerd to be able to use the site. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's 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 one of the examples. Um, uh, this is uh, um, this is uh, uh, from um, a drawing of the Sphinx statue. Uh, from work that Mark Lehner did uh, way back in the 70s and 80s. And it's just a, you know, a very high resolution scan of a, a plan 
and it's color coded with different episodes of restoration work that happened on the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. Some of that restoration work is actually dates back to the New Kingdom, so around 1500 BCE or so, so um, through to the present day. And that's actually something that's been really kind of, it's also useful for tracking like um, more recent erosion and changes on, on the Sphinx statue um, with uh, climate change and more wind and dust blowing around. Anybody else? Yes. There's another question online from a chat. Okay. I can't see it, sorry. <laughs> Jordan is asking, could you talk, thanks for the talk, could you talk a little more about any favorite studies that have come out of drawing data from across projects, post development projects? Um, well, that would be yours. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I, I think the biggest, the biggest sort of aggregative data reuse that has come out reusing the uh, information that we published has been around zooarchaeology because there's already these traditions of reuse of information in zooarchaeology. And then a lot of the information is really comparable across uh, different sites and time periods and regions. So zooarchaeology, um, a court study uh, led by Ben Arbuckle around um, looking at the uh, dispersion of uh, animal husbandry uh, from the Near East towards Europe. Uh, that came out in, in uh, PLOS One, uh, I think 2016 or so. And um, other really interesting work has been done by uh, Catherine Cook and um, Kevin Gardsky around actually using this for teaching, which is also really a, a really important um, role that we need to recognize. And they've published um, some interesting uh, work about what the challenges are, how to make some improvements, and making this um, more usable for instructional kinds of purposes also. So that's something we're really grateful for, um, the work that they've been doing too. Anything else? Yeah. It's a really uh, simple question, but if this is open source, that's the goal, mm -hmm. and individuals or projects put their material up, is it like a burial plot? It's there forever? <laughs> in theory, or is uh, it like you know what happens when those people who put it up pass away? Yeah. I mean, is it then? I mean, like the that thesaurus. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to use that as an example. Mm -hmm. My thought of thesaurus was like term definitions, mm -hmm. like a. Uh, you know, a, a, let's say, you know, a, a triticum monococcum yeah. will be a triticum spelled the correct way, by the way, in every single site that you link together like your bones, right? Yeah. And so I thought that that's what the British means, what the, my concept of a thorus is once it's a triticum monococcum, it doesn't matter what's linking, it's still a triticum monococcum and you can push a button and see where those exist. But it sounds like it was doing much more than make standardizing definition. It was doing some linking things that you lost. Can you just explain right. that and how that's different from what you're doing? So, no, that's a good question. Um, so the British Museum's thesaurus was that. It was an authoritative definition for different kinds of terms, concepts, right? Different classifications that people use. And it was made computer actionable, meaning that the relationships between those concepts were described using standards that computers can understand. So like one of the biggest things is uh, hierarchy, right? Here's a parent concept and a parent like mammal, and then mammals have primates and carnivores, et cetera, et cetera, underneath them. And so having those formal relationships between those concepts is really useful uh, uh, because uh, then you can start making inferences to, you know, I want to search for mammals. Oh, that means you also want dogs, right? Oh, that kind of thing. That makes sense. Right, so the, the British Museum's thesaurus was published in a way that's a definition. It was made computer actionable. And they had web identifiers as the, uh, basically the ID for each concept. That's, that's great, um, provided that somebody's actually gonna sustain those web identifiers, those links, right? But that's what I don't understand, a mammal, once you define the mammal, why do you need a link? I mean, you just, that's always gonna be a mammal. Right, but how do you, how do you identify, where do you look up mammal? What source? You don't look up on the, the source. You, well, that's what the British Museum was the, the it source. It was sort of like a dictionary, right? Yeah. Saying, I mean, yeah. You're going to define mammal as this, and we're right. going to define dog and goat. Right. It's just like 
Yes, it's just that how do you know that it's the British Museum's mammal versus somebody else's mammal? That's the thing. Like it's the way that those links provide um, an identity to the concept. And um, because another good example is like places, uh, Alexandria, right? This is a place, right? Well, it's actually multiple places, <laughs> right? There's an Alexandria in Virginia, and there's a very famous one in Egypt, right? So which Alexandria are you talking about? So a gazetteer is really useful for disambiguating which one of those you're talking about. And uh, there are web gazetteers that do that, that have web identifiers for different places. And we use those and we link to those and we have to trust that they're gonna be around. And um, what I think is the, the, the critical thing is this like, it's not that gazetteers made with computers are bad or put up on the web are bad. What's broken is our governance of that and our institutions not prioritizing and maintaining these things. That's, I think, the real critical lesson here. So suddenly all those definitions just went down. Exactly. And yeah, and it's, it's, not, it's not just about pulling your definition and saying, this is what I'm using, putting it in your database. It's that you have a link to that thing. So others and computers can know grab that, that mammal. Yeah, there. that link is right. broken. Then the link is broken and your thing is suddenly not really. You broken. can't go get that mammal. Right. Yeah. There's a really, in, yeah, there's a really interesting project called Pelagios, which has done a really interesting work in aggregating um, geospatial references, common references to places like with gazetteers. And so what they've done is like, um, you know, uh, they mostly focused on um, the Mediterranean world. So um, Herodotus wrote about a lot of places and mentioned a lot of places in his text. Um, they've linked those places mentioned in the text to the gazetteers. And you can sort of scroll, you can sort of map out Herodotus's book as he wanders around talking about different places. And then you can see material culture that's associated, but for the same place that maybe is stored in a museum. And those kinds of aggregative ways of doing things to be able to pull together related information that's really context rich is driven by the fact that there are these web identifiers that make a very unambiguous assignment about Ah, you're talking about that Alexandria, the one in Egypt, not the one in Virginia. So that's the kind of thing that's um, really important. It's the notion, um, this, I, I um, didn't get to this in my talk talk uh, because we ran out of time, sadly, but um, the difference between a literal and an identifier is really a critical thing to do in your own database. So a literal is just like some description about something, right? And uh, it could be like a text note, it could be the length of something, but an identifier is something to think about because an identifier is something that could be described elsewhere. And you wanna think about that when you're thinking about your own data, is this concept that I have in my own spreadsheet, is this something that could be potentially described elsewhere, like a context record, right? And if it's a context record, then you better make sure that it's identified in a way that's unambiguous and that somebody can actually look up because then you, all of a sudden you've added context to your own information. And the same thing with something like um, biological taxa, something like that, sheep goat, you know, is this defined someplace? And can I point to it in a way that other people could also point to it? And then all of a sudden, if, if we have a lot of people pointing to these similar concepts, then our data join together in an interesting kind of a way. They're related by those uh, shared concepts. Yeah. Isn't one of the challenges to that would be the different definitions? So I'm thinking of, say, stone tool artifacts, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what they, you know, backlay to some people is something else to somebody else. Yeah. So are there you know, do people then link to specific typologies or? Yeah, you can link to specific typologies. I mean, so what we do with all the context, we do both. You define it the way you want. It, right. It's your back blades. Right. And we'll just <laughs> represent your back blades, but we'll give your back blades an address. Okay. <laughs> so somebody else can cite that. Yeah. So um, one of the examples would be, uh, so let's say here's an object type, um, you know, Rocketto. So this has a landing page. You could cite that typological concept of a Rocketto. And here are a bunch of examples about it. You can make a definition description about that and um, you cite that in your own work. And that would be something that would be, okay, so at least somebody might agree with you or they uh, to say that I'm using MakeConkey's backblades. Uh, if there's a wider standard, like some committee of 
lithesis gets together and defines a whole bunch of uh, uh, object classes, then you could reference that and decide that my black blade is a subtype of this general type. And, but the nice thing about doing all that is you start making these things explicit and it can be computationally actionable. And then that's when, when that starts to happen, then first of all, people sort of wishy-washy do things all the time in literature. And you can never really understand sometimes what they're talking about because it's all wishy-washy. But doing this in this way makes it explicit so you can disagree or not. You know, these are, it's just because it's not a computer doesn't make it objective, but I'm, it just makes it explicit. <laughs> so at least it makes it something that you can actually sort of like, okay, you can do, agree or disagree. It's not an objective fact, but at least it's made explicit what this relationship is. A way of reducing it to the inherent ambiguity. Yeah. Because you know, archaeological data and descriptions and everything yeah. are more ambiguous than they are. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. I mean, a typology is hard, right? I mean, people have functional types, people do use shape and form right. as type. I mean, it's, it's sometimes it's by, by manufacturing kinds of processes. So, yeah, it's a, it's a hard problem. It's, um, you, we, we're not going to solve it necessarily ourselves, but at least the idea is here. So let's start being a, a little bit more explicit about what we're talking about. That's mainly the that's that's mainly what is the incremental step that I think is more achievable. Yeah. But yes. I was going to say, we can make more kid ideas for everything.